Good morning, everybody. Welcome to uh, this morning's session. Um, it's entitled Mobile Learning for the Hard to Reach. And perhaps first I ought to introduce myself. I'm John Traxler, and I'm a professor of mobile learning. Apparently, I'm the only professor of mobile learning. Um, and I've dev devoted my last 10 years, I suppose, to attempting to explore the possibilities that um, we can use mobile devices, mobile phones in education. Um, and I think one of our achievements has been to show that we can reach out to people and communities who were previously inaccessible to other educational interventions. And so the purpose of this morning's debate and discussion is actually to explore um, the nature of that possibility, uh, to look at some of those interventions and see what they tell us about the future. Um, and I think this is especially significant now because we're clearly moving into an era when these kinds of devices have become cheap, reliable, ubiquitous, and that opens up possibly much more sustainable models of using mobile technology to enhance and extend and support learning. Um, and we've also actually, of course, seen the involvement of mobile technologies in all sorts of social and political change uh, these last few years. From left to right, we have Lob Laurie Butkerite Butker from South Africa, Tim Unwin from the United Kingdom, and Shabnan Agwal from India, and we're going to start by actually asking them to put the question, the, the, the topic, uh, in the context of their own work. Um, so I'll start with... I'll start, John. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the Dr. Math Project that we're running in South Africa. And you know, on Monday in one of the sessions, people said that Teenagers have good ideas also. It might have been in Mark Princey's, um, Princely's session. And in South Africa, way before BlackBerry was there, there was a company called Mixit that did internet chat over cell phones for about the past 10 years. And South Africa has about 50 million people, and Mixit claims about 20 million users, most of them being teenagers. So we wanted to help with mathematics education. And it was the teenager's idea that maybe we can help them on these devices using Mixit, the chat mechanism, again, similar to BlackBerry, but independent. And so what we started doing was like a homework helpline. Now, originally, we didn't think we'd get more than about 20 or 30 kids. If you think about it, this device is very personal. It's more personal than your toothbrush. I'll loan you my toothbrush before I loan you my cell phone, okay? So we didn't think teenagers would actually want to talk about mathematics, but we tried it. So we expected 20, 30, maybe 50 kids to take part, and we got 100, and then we got 500, and then we got 1,000. In fact, yesterday, we talked about scaling up. From that 20 or 30, we have about 30,000 children now, primary and secondary school pupils, who talk to us about their mathematics. Now, we run a volunteer model for the tutors. So we take volunteers from the local universities, and the volunteers sit at normal internet terminals, and they field these questions from the, from the kids. So the kids start asking questions around 2 in the afternoon, and depending on the volunteers' schedules, uh, we often operate until midnight, talking about mathematics up through high school trigonometry, some elementary calculus, um, all on two and a half inches on your cell phone screen. And hopefully, we're going to be scaling up to even larger numbers in the next year or so. So um, watch this space. Thank you, Laurie. Over to Tim next, please. Thanks, John, and uh, I'd just like to thank everyone who's put this session together. I think we're, we're exploring some really challenging issues at the frontiers of where education might move, and, and Mixit's certainly a great example. Um, yeah, John asked us to say a little bit about ourselves, and, and in five minutes, it, it's interesting to think where we might begin. After Gordon's uh, inspirational opening, I thought I would begin by sort of saying, well, you know, Socrates had sussed out most 21st century skills quite a long time ago. Um, but uh, you know, at a theoretical level, for the the last ooh, 25 years, I think I've been very interested in the ways in which technology and power are related. 
I think those of us who believe in the use of new technologies to support some of the young, marginalized people in the world have to believe that technologies can serve the interests of the poorest and most marginalized communities with which we're working. Yet historically, technology has been used by those in power to remain in power. So at a theoretical level, that's something that, that has challenged me and interests me. And I just wonder the extent to which mobile devices can actually change that with respect to learning. And my views have changed, I, I think, from being very optimistic to being actually much more pessimistic now. I think at a practical level, we, we just went behind the scenes earlier to see how our names were going to be. Uh, and I was put down as emeritus professor, and I wanted that change to emeritus learner. Because I think in much of the discussions we've had so far, there's been far too much of a division between teachers and students. Um, I, I hope I'm a youngish learner still here. But uh, my research really over the last 10 to 15 years has been to do with how we can use ICTs to support uh, the most marginalized people. Um, and I care passionately about that. And if some of the things I'm going to say today actually seem to imply that uh, I'm skeptical about the use of mobile learning, uh, that's because it could do so much more than it's already done. Take country Y that has 75% mobile connectivity. We tend to think that's marvelous. We tend to think that we can therefore roll out mobile learning to those people. Yet I view that as a disaster. 25% don't. And if we look at the latest fantastic publication by the ITU on the use of ICTs in developing countries, what it shows without any question of doubt is that the differences between access and use, between the, the rich countries, the developing countries who are all on an upward curve, and the least developed countries who are all on the bottom are getting greater. So actually, technology is making it relatively more difficult for the most marginalized to have the benefits that most of us take for granted. And that's not just that they don't have, and this is not a cheap device, an iPhone is not a cheap device. You know, many, many poor people would only have a phone like this. Um, and, and what you can do with this, yes, there are some things, but it's nothing like as cool as, as you can with this. So I want us to address the 25% who don't. I spent three months in China this year learning, uh, and I'd like to pay tribute to uh, one of the young learners here, Chen Fei, who was able to show me around and, and act as my research assistant. And I learned so much in that time. I learned so much about focusing on the needs of poor and marginalized communities. And as will come up probably in some of the discussions later, uh, there are so many people who we tend to leave out. You know, people with disabilities have so much more to gain from ICTs than those of us who have fewer disabilities. And yet, for a whole range of reasons, we're not really addressing them in the way that we should. How many speakers here have been people with disabilities, as, as is often defined? And, and the potential for mobile learning to support them in all sorts of different ways is enormous. And I would love us to be addressing that uh, much more concretely. And that's something that um, the Commonwealth Telecommunications Organization is very much going to be focusing on in the years ahead. But also learning, and, and in the discussion this morning, we focused a little bit around uh, the difference between lifelong learning and formal learning. Um, I don't actually get too hung up about that. I think schools are going to remain for a while because power structures want them to remain. But, but we all learn throughout our lives. And, and the, the diversity of learning needs of people in rural areas of China and, and likewise elsewhere in the world are enormous, but they're differentiated. We tend to want to provide blanket solutions, and we don't think enough about actually what the needs are. Um, I'll leave it to your imagination what the needs of uh, unemployed migrant workers in rural China are. Um, and and you know, we all talk about use of mobile learning for farmers. Hey, but farmers are generally quite rich. It's, it's the landless laborers who are poor. So I guess you know, my passion is about using ICTs and mobiles in particular to address the needs of the poorest and most marginalized. Uh, the market will take care of the majority. It is incumbent on states to deliver on the needs of all of their people so that we can actually make this world in which we live a fairer and better place. Um, I'll leave it there, John. Um, I could obviously rabbit on for much longer, uh, but I hope we'll have a chance to engage with some of these ideas in our discussion. Absolutely. Thanks very much. And from Tim to Shabnan, please, from speaking from India about her experiences. 
Thank you, John. Um, hi, my name is Shabna Magarwal, and I, like Tim, have had an obsession with technology for the past 25 years, but that's been my whole life. Um, um, and in the <laughs> but in the past five or six years, I've had a, a particular obsession with mobile phones, um, which I'd like to talk a little bit more about. Um, I started out in Germany, actually, where I was uh, writing code for a new Nokia phone, and I was kind of interested in that, um, thinking that that would be uh, really a fun experience, but actually I didn't feel like it was accessing the people that I cared most about, which was the poor. Um, so I went out to Bangalore and I helped a microfinance organization speed up their loan process uh, through the use of mobile phones. And that's actually where I came to realize that cell phones could, are, are the technology that, that are going to leapfrog all other technologies by accessing the poor first. Um, although TVs have done something similar, I think that cell phones have much more power um, and, and, and in a teeny tiny space as well. Um, and, and so this is kind of where the obsession started. Um, and it was soon after that that I became really fascinated with the educational implications of a cell phone uh, when I was in Cambodia. So I'll tell you a little story. <laughs> I was uh, sitting with a friend of mine named Cham Nool, uh, who had just recently been rescued from the sex trade in Cambodia. And we were having a really, really difficult time conversing. As you can imagine, she had really had very little education uh, growing up, and, and um, we were just really having a struggle. And so, out of pure boredom, she decides to, you know, pull out her cell phone, which, of course, is more like Tim's uh, um, cell phone than, than my iPhone. <laughs> and uh, and she, starts, she starts typing and laughing hysterically. And I'm just sitting there thinking, great, okay, <laughs> how do I engage this person? And um, so I look over at her cell phone, and, and I see that she's, you know, she's got... She She's got a joke on her cell phone through a text message written in Roman letters. And here I am trying to teach her the ABCs. <laughs> so, so here I am thinking, OK, clearly I have missed out on something um, obvious, which is that she already knows the ABCs, um, but in a very different context. And it was kind of this aha moment where I thought, OK, well, here we are. You know, there's, there's something that can be done about this in a much smarter way. Um, and there's a way to capitalize upon this um, that I think I wanted to, to, th to work on. So I went off to India soon after that to experiment in making fun educational games on cell phones with, a, with an organization called Millie. And theoretically, what we were trying to do was both uh, entertain, teach English, and access the poor all at once, the holy grail of education, as you might imagine. Um, and it turns out, obviously, that this is much easier said than done. After a lot of struggle, I decided that we were coming at this in entirely the wrong way. We were focused entirely on children and not the teachers at all. So I decided to take a step back and go on something that I dubbed the Teach Tour, which is where I went to talk to various educators around the developing world and really find out what it meant to be an educator, for one, and not just an educator, but a parent and anyone who's working with children. Um, and two, if there was anything that had succeeded in technology, um, in education and technology combined. And I, like Tim, have become gone from being a very optimistic person in, edu in educational technologies to uh, a critic, I would say. Um, and, and so now, um, my focus is more in teaching adults, as I said, and um, using technology in more of an assistive manner than, um, than as the primary, rather than the primary tool. Um, so just briefly, what I do now is I work with Digital Green in uh, New Delhi in India, and what we do is we make videos for and with farmers to teach each other about best agriculture practices uh, in rural India. Thank you. Okay, thanks to all three of you for giving us all some context uh, and a bit more meaning around what mobile learning might mean in terms of the hard to reach. I think we're all already beginning to see that what seems a kind of simplistic and attractive notion that mobile technology will help reach people at the bottom of the pyramid, or indeed near to the bottom of the pyramid, um, we're beginning to see how that's rather more complex and uh, rather more problematic than might have originally seemed, as each of the panelists have pointed out in their different ways. 